can go and stand Cause I know my Jesus Answers all my prayers Well, well, I know my Lord To my home and heart I often go and stand When I die, when I die Oh Lord, you know I can hardly wait To reach that sweet body I fall by my way Oh Lord, I see Those perfect home gates To me, you will do all I can. I'll live by hand. I'll live by hand. My soul, my battle is all on me. I won't give go and stand. It's what I got.
Good morning, everybody. Good to see you all. Welcome, welcome, welcome to worship at Oak Grove Baptist Church. Hey, in your right in front of you, there's some things we used to call song books or hymnals. They'll be on the screen, but also, if you'd like to use the book, number 676 in the back is what we call a responsive reading. And we're going to begin with that. So if you're inclined to take a book, you can do that. If you like to look at the big screen, you can do that too. But we're going to stand together and read 676. I'd like for this side over here to read the light type and this side over here to read the bold type. I'll read both types, so don't follow me. <laughs> but this side, the lighter print, this side, the darker print. Let's stand together and enjoy responsive reading 676. Here we go, this side. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may be also glorified together. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Father, thank you so much for these verses from Romans 8. It's one of the mountain peaks of the New Testament. It's a chapter that begins with no condemnation. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus, who walk in the Spirit, not according to the flesh. And as we just read, it ends with no separation. Nothing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And in between the no condemnation and the no separation, Lord, you show me there's no probation, that we're heirs. We're already joint heirs with Jesus. Everything that He has, we have through our relationship with You through Him and what He's done on the cross. So no matter where we're at in our lives today, maybe some of us are really doing well, or maybe some of us are struggling, or maybe some of us are just sort of in the middle. We just, we just don't know right now because of this or that other thing. But nothing changes our relationship with You. Nothing sets us aside. You are on our hearts and in our minds. And so, Father, help us to reconcile what we think and how we feel with what You say in Your Word. Help us to rise above the present disturbances and distractions of this world and daily living and focus upon the fact that You're our God and we're Your people. And nothing can change that by what You say. And we thank You for that, Father. In Jesus' name, Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Good to see you this morning. Take a look in your bulletin. There's some things going on. We'll be having lunch here in a minute if you'd like to stay and uh, eat with us today in the fellowship hall when our worship time is over. You're more than welcome to do that. 
and I hope you will. Um, our D groups will be starting up in a couple of weeks. Some people just like to wait until the last minute to sign up. Are you one of those kind of people? Uh, well, you've almost waited to the last minute if you haven't signed up yet. So we have a morning group that will be meeting on Mondays at 9 a.m. Oh, it's in there. You see that. And then a Sunday night group at 6 and a Wednesday night group at 6 as well. So if you'd like to be part of one of those groups, we'll be going through the Disciples' Cross, which is a great book for learning the basics of discipleship and Christian growth. And uh, we'd love to have you be in one of those groups. If you have any questions about that, you can talk to me about it, and I'll try to answer your question best as I can. Uh, also, in a couple of weeks, right over here in the Sunday School Room, we're going to do a unit of Tell Someone training by Greg Laurie. We did that this summer. And if you'd like to uh, be involved in some equipping for sharing your faith, you don't have to go to tell someone to tell someone. You know, you can tell somebody, but this is a training that uses your testimony basically as the backbone of sharing your faith. So there are books available for that. You don't have to have a book to be in the group. There's a video part of it as well. But if you'd like a book, let me know and we'll get you a book and you can participate in that. It's about six weeks, eight weeks long, and then uh, they move back to regular Sunday school class. But we'll be doing that on uh, at 9.30. So if you'd like to become involved in some of those groups and grow in your faith, we'd sure love to have you be part of that. And um, preschool starting up. You see the dates for that. If you'd like to help with preschool, see Loretta Kirchmar. If you'd like to volunteer and help, they meet on Tuesdays and Thursdays from 9 to 11 down in the in the basement there and uh, any other thing on the back if you'd like to be what involved in youth ministry children's ministry welcome team it's all back there the people to talk to about that and we'd love to plug you into some service here in the church both in church and outside as we do outreaches and stuff like that so all that's there and uh, please make note of that as you can now lady's going to play the guitar the guitar they're going to play the piano and I'm going to try to lead us in worship, so we're ready. Let's do it. <laughs> Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious. Sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sang as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on the heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Fasting alone in the desert, tell of the days that are past. How for our sins he was tempted, yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor. Tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and afflicted, homeless, rejected, and poor. Tell me the story of Jesus, right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he lived again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper. Love laid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweet 
kiss that ever does hurt. That's the school song of my alma mater, the Baptist College of Florida. Yep, that was our school song. It was Baptist Bible Institute when I went, but they changed the name now. It's called the Baptist College of Florida, way down yonder in the Panhandle, Lower Alabama, L.A. The uh, little community of Graceville. What a great name for a community. Now we got number 595 if you're going to buy the book. If not, it's on the big screen. Send the light. Let's do it, ladies. There's a call comes ringing for the restless wave. Send the light, send the light. There are souls to rescue, there are souls to save. Send the light, send the light, send the light. The blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light. Forevermore, we have heard the Macedonian call today. Send the light, send the light, and the golden offering at the cross we lay. Send the light, send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light. Let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us pray that grace may everywhere abound. Send the light, send the light, and the Christ-like spirit everywhere be found. Send the light, send the light, send the light. Gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Let us not grow weary in the work of love. Send the light, send the light. Let us gather jewels for a crown above. Send the light. Send the light, send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine from shore to shore. Send the light, the blessed gospel light, let it shine forevermore. Jesus is the song, number 552, if you're following along in the book. If not, it's on the screen. Jesus is the song. My Savior is the Lord and King. He has control of everything. He loves me and He bids me sing. He gives His song to me. Jesus is song of life, Jesus is the song of joy, Jesus is the song of love, Jesus gives his song to me. He calms my hurts, dries my tears, he gives me strength to face my fear, he sends his grace through all my years.
I guess that's it. <laughs> Thank you, ladies. Fantastic job. The Gospel of Mark, if you'd like to turn there at this time, thank you for helping us worship today. You all sound like a big choir out there. I want to begin a series of messages leading us in the fall up to Christmas probably about the Jesus followers. We call them the 12 disciples sometimes. But we want to think about this idea of being a Jesus follower not only from the historical perspective and the biblical perspective, but the practical and everyday perspective. So it's going to be a little bit different sort of angle on the lives of the disciples. You know, Peter's mentioned almost 50 times in the Gospels. James the less, less. <laughs> James, we only know about his name. So this isn't going to be uh, a series of messages on like biographies of each one of them. But what we're going to do after this introductory time this morning in the following weeks, and I hope you'll be able to stay with us or see it online if you're unable to attend personally, is we're going to draw one characteristic of a Jesus follower from each of these disciples' lives. So, uh, that's the angle I'm going to take. I'm going to try to draw the characteristics that we need as Jesus followers. And so this, instead of being like a video or movie of the disciples, more like a snapshot. You know, a picture just captures one day or one scene or one event. So we won't be looking in great detail at the lives of the disciples, but just one characteristic of their life that made them a good Jesus follower, that can help us to be better Jesus followers. And when you put them all together, the different characteristics, you get a composite of some of the main characteristics that ought to be part of our lives as we follow Jesus Christ. Obviously, none of us is following as good as we'd like. We all have areas where we wish we were doing better. But I think we get better by looking at people who've gone before us. And of course, that's the, the great uh, encouraging aspect of biography, whether it's Bible biography or if you like historical biographies. Uh, we're always looking for people to follow in life, role models, how to do it in different areas of life. And God's made us that way. And discipleship, somebody has said, may have been... Uh, um, his name just escaped me. Master Plan of Evangelism and Discipleship. Uh, I think he said discipleship is better caught than taught. So we have times and we have groups and we have curriculum, and that's important. Yes, it is. To invest times in our lives with other people around God's Word, fellowshipping, growing. But discipleship is really something you live out and you catch it in other people. So it's good to surround yourself with people a little older in the faith, a little more experienced, but it's also good to look back and see who's behind you a little bit and, 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 and grow in that. So that's what we're looking forward to doing. Now, 30 times or so in the Bible, Jesus said, follow me. And so that's the basis for being a Jesus follower or a disciple. We might say a growing believer. There's different ways to describe it. But I'm using this term, Jesus followers. And here in Mark 3, 13 through 19, we see the, the, the night and the day that Jesus called these 12 guys. Mark tells us he goes into a mountain. We don't know which mountain it was. Could have been the Sermon on the Mount or some other mountain, but we don't know. He goes into a mountain and call. There's the word. He calls unto him whom he would or whom he desired or whom he wanted. And they came unto him. And he ordained twelve. Now that word ordained means appointed or designated. It doesn't mean like an ordination service like we do in a church today. Jesus didn't have them come up and sit on them, lay hands on them or anything like that. He just set these twelve apart. He selected them. He appointed them. He designated them. That they should be with him. 
that He might send them forth to preach, verse 15, have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. Simon, he surnamed Peter. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, he surnamed them Blanerges, the sons of thunder, the thunder twins. <laughs> we'll see them in a couple of weeks. And Andrew and Philip and Bartholomew, who's also called Nathaniel. There's four lists of disciples, by the way, in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Acts. And some of the names are different. But when you compare all the lists, Bartholomew is the Nathaniel of John chapter 1, if you go read John chapter 1. Matthew, who's also called Levi. Thomas, who's also called Didymus, or the twin. James, the son of Alphaeus, he's also called James the Less, little Jim. <laughs> Thaddeus, who's also called by some other names, um, Jude, Judas, not Judas Iscariot. You can read about him in John chapter 14 if you like. And Simon the Canaanite, or Simon the Zealot. Uh, zealot being a political figure. We would call him a terrorist today, or an insurrectionist. He wanted to overthrow the Roman government. So Canaanite there doesn't mean from Canaan, or from Cana. Literally, the word there is Sakari in the Aramaic, which means men of the dagger. He was part of a group, a clandestine guerrilla group, and they... Interesting. Anyway, we'll get to him in a couple of weeks. And then verse 19, Judas Iscariot, which betrayed him, and they went into a house. Probably Peter's house. And they're in uh, Caesarea. Um, Peter was married at this time, and that's probably kind of Jesus' headquarters when he started his ministry. So, we want to look at three basic ideas. We're going to be in Mark chapter 3. And you also might get Luke chapter 9 ready and Luke chapter 14 as we introduce this idea of Jesus' followers, as we look at Jesus' followers, and we think about being Jesus' followers. Because everybody's going to follow something. Everybody's going to follow somebody. The thing is, when you follow on whoever or whatever, where will you be when you get where you're going? When you follow that person or that thing in life. Jesus followers. We're going to look at the call to Jesus followers here in Mark chapter 3. And then in Luke 9 and 14, we're going to look at the conditions for Jesus followers. And then finally, the commitment of Jesus followers at the end of Luke chapter 9. So hopefully you'll keep up with me and I'll try to get done on time. <laughs> First of all, let's think about the call. Here it says, He went up in the mountain and called unto Him, them whom he would. So why did Jesus need followers in the first place? Why did he call these guys? See, you, ne you need to know your why to find your way in life. The answer to the question why will determine your way in life. So why did Jesus call 12, for instance? I mean, why didn't he call 10? Why didn't he call 8? It would been easier to handle 3. <laughs> And of course, there's 12 tribes in the Old Testament. And these 12 men become the fulfillment of the Old Testament promises and ultimately the kingdom. Jesus came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of God is near. Matthew 19, 28, he said this to these 12 men. He said, you shall sit on 12 thrones judging or adjudicating, literally, the affairs of the nation of Israel and the world in the kingdom. Now, the kingdom's not here yet because they killed the king. But the king is risen and the king's coming again. And when he comes, he's going to set up his kingdom. And these 12 guys, of course, minus Judas, we'll get to that if you stay with me through the next few weeks. But these 12 thrones or 12 seats are places of authority. And then in Revelation 21 and 14, it says that there are going to be 12 names of the 12 apostles on the 12 foundations in the New Jerusalem, the holy city. So when we get to heaven and see this holy city, you're going to see their names etched in the 12 foundations. As fascinating as that is to think about. So the number 12 is indicative of God's government through human instruments. And so these 12 represent the fact that in the kingdom, Jesus is going to rule and reign supreme, and everything's going to be the way it's supposed to be. 
It's not that way now. You may have noticed. <laughs> but soon and very soon, we're going to see the king, as the old song says from Bill Gaither, and then things are going to be right. And this is part of that. So why 12? There's a couple of reasons. And then why these 12? We didn't read it, but you might write that in your margin, Luke 6, 12. In Luke's account of this episode in Mark chapter 3, Luke says that Jesus went up in the mountain and He prayed all night. And after an all-night prayer meeting with God, He called these 12 guys. You see, after he couldn't, he, couldn't He have done a little bit better? <laughs> We've got to remember, God's only got us to work with. It's a wonder He can get anything done, right? But the good news is, He chooses to call us to be His followers. He knows we're flawed. He knows we're messed up. He knows we're broken. He knows we're hurt. But He loves us, as we read in the responsive reading. And nothing can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. And so, after a night of prayer, He calls these guys, these twelve. Now we know, if you go read Luke chapter 10, there were 70 others He sent out a little bit later. And after He ascended to heaven, there in the upper room, Acts chapter 2, there was 120. So there were other Jesus followers, both men and women. But these 12 become that innermost group, and some were closer to Him, and some were not, for one reason or another. Sometimes, as we follow Jesus, we can be closer, and sometimes not, for different reasons. And that's why it's good from time to time to think about, how am I, am I listening to the Lord? How am I living for the Lord? Am I where I need to be with Him. And, and it's never, from God's perspective, condemnation. But it can be sometimes the conviction that, hey, I'm stuck, or I'm drifting. And you never drift towards God. And I need to, and I better fill in the blank, whatever that is. So this series of messages on these guys is just meant to bring us back to that sort of true north. Because there's a lot of things in the world that distract us and disturb us and divide us, as we know. So, a consistent call back to Jesus and following Him is all I'm trying to accomplish in encouraging you and equipping you to be the people of God that we need to be as we move forward. Now, look at verse 14 and 15. The call to Jesus' followers. Why does He call us at all? Well, two things here that are so important. Notice this. This is so important. So crucial. He ordained 12 that they should be, number one, with Him. Now Mark's the only one that says that out of all the ones that talk about the disciple list. But I like that. Ultimately, Jesus called us is for us to be with Him. He doesn't demand that we do this or that, ask us to do the other. He wants us to follow Him. That's why He took these guys and they spent time together. They did life together. They went through stuff together. They experienced things. Again, discipleship, Jesus following, can involve studies and curriculum and groups and classes and video and internet. All that stuff's great. But it will never take the place of spending time with Him. It can be part of that. People can go to classes, learn Scripture, memorize stuff, and we should do that. But many times people who are involved in churches or religious things or, or groups, as good as those things are, they're not following Jesus. They're just filling in blanks in a book. They're just going to do something because they think that's the thing they need to do. And it's after we have these groups and get-togethers, that we need to walk with Him, follow Him. So that's number one. Don't miss that. He called them that they might be with Him. And then secondly, uh, there in verse 14 and 15, and that He might send them forth to preach, heal, cast out the devils. Basically, He said, I want you to be with Me and do what I do. Learn how to do what I do. And that's the basis of discipleship. We call it apprenticing sometimes in the workforce, you know. You, you learn a job by 
job shadowing someone or coming along someone and you, you learn how to do what they do, you interact, there's conversations, you solve problems, and then the person who's mentoring you or, or teaching you, they start to back off a little bit and you get some more responsibility. And then if you get in a bind, you can always send them a text message and say, help! <laughs> and they'll come back and say, what's the problem? And they'll work through that with you. And eventually that person is completely gone and now you are in the position of authority and knowledge and all that. Same thing in the spiritual realm. He wants us to spend time with Him and then time with each other as a group and learn how to do what He does. So notice in verse 14, it's a be, and then in verse 15, it's a do. We are first human beings, not human doings. So don't get caught up in the performance trap thinking if I just do a little more for Jesus, I'm a better Jesus follower. It's not like that. Don't get the cart before the horse. Don't let the tail wag the dog, as they say down south. Spend time with Jesus, and then do out of that relationship. That's a good way to keep yourself strong from getting weary and broke down, because we all see problems, we all know people, we all like to get involved in helping people, saving people, uh, ministering to people, but each of us only has a certain amount of time. Each of us only has a certain amount of emotional energy that we can invest in other people. How do we know who to and who not to? How much to and how little to? Only Jesus can show you that. And He will. And uh, that's what we see here. He called them to be like He is and to do what He does. And that's what He expects from us today too. So Jesus called them. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling us to be His followers. When you follow Him, you've got to walk with Him. You've got to walk His pace. You've got to walk His way. Sometimes His pace is glacial. I say, Lord, would you please hurry up? <laughs> you know, And I'm just sort of waiting. Other times he's going so fast I can't catch him. You know what I mean? So following him means just that. Being with him, walking his way, walking his pace, listening to him, watching him, looking for him in my everyday and the ordinary as he makes it extraordinary. That's a Jesus follower. That's the call. All right, flip on over to Luke chapter 9. Let's shift gears here. If I'm going to be a Jesus follower, I'm going to have to meet certain conditions. Now, these conditions have nothing to do with salvation. Salvation is by grace, through faith, according to what He did on the cross. Jesus paid it all. I trust Him. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven. Nothing can ever change that. Praise the Lord. But to be a disciple, I've got to make some choices. I've got to meet some conditions. And what I like so much, love so much about Jesus is He's not like a used car salesman. He doesn't put the fine print on the bottom and then you find out later what you signed up for. He was always upfront and honest about what it was going to cost to follow Him. So I want to show you these five conditions. Luke 9, 23. This is our memory verse for the week. We'll come back to this verse at the end of the message, Lord willing. Luke 9, 23. What are the conditions for a Jesus follower? Number one, he says, deny yourself. He said to them all, not just a few, not just the super spiritual, not just the one that want everybody. So it's an equal opportunity call to meet these conditions. He said to them all, if anyone will come after me, some versions will say follow me there, let him deny himself. Now, that's always been difficult, but it's especially difficult today in the selfie culture. We have a culture that exalts the self. It's all about me. Everything in advertising is meant to stir up the self and uh, to make me the center of everything. And so we have a lot in the media, we have a lot in, on the internet, we have a lot through different influences and influencers, if you're familiar with that concept, I know the young people are, that, that causes us to, to not really hear this deny yourself. And denying yourself, without getting off track, stay with me, is not self-denial. 
Self-denial is a religious substitute for true biblical denying of self. Self-denial is bringing attention to myself because I'm not doing this, or I don't do that, or I don't do the other. I'm not talking about that. But Jesus says the first thing we must do is deny self. Now that's very, very difficult. But that's the beginning condition. A couple of weeks ago, I was over at Tilden preaching a weekend revival, and I preached through the book of Jonah. And I told the people at Tilden, the big fish in Jonah is not a big fish. The big fish in Jonah is selfish. <laughs> we all have been swallowed by a selfish. Not a shellfish. Not a sailfish. A selfish. We've all got this self, pride, me, ego. And of course, ego is an acronym for edging God out. We have a way of being religious and churchy and leaving God out. Forgetting about repentance and holiness and love and commitment. And Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to deny yourself. How do I do that? Number two, you've got to take up your cross. You've got to die to self. You've got to die to your preferences. You've got to die to your political persuasions. You've got to die to all of those passions that you thought at one time were so important. But then Jesus came with the cross and said, take it up. The cross is not jewelry. The cross is an instrument of death. It executes me as I take it up. The cross is not your ex-wife. The cross is not your boss on the job. You've got such a cross to bear people. The cross is you being willing to allow the Holy Spirit of God execute everything in you that is not like the Jesus who is calling you to follow Him. And it's a lifelong process. And most American Christians don't have any time or stomach for it. But it is a condition of of being a Jesus follower. And as you read the Gospels, you see these original Jesus followers struggling with this constantly. Their temperaments, their personalities, their interaction, they clash. They always wanted to talk about who's going to be number one, who's going to be the greatest, who's going They had to learn how to deny self, and so do we. You take up your cross. Paul said it this way in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2.20. Memorize it. Master it. Allow it to make you the Jesus follower you desire to be. And He died to make you be. Third condition, daily. <laughs> It doesn't just mean in the morning. It means all day long. You know, you can be a Jesus follower at church and then go to the Grecian and get mad because somebody got your parking spot. <laughs> you're not following Jesus now because you're bent out of shape because the Methodists got there before you did. <laughs> Why is that? How can we jump so much into the Spirit and then back into the flesh? Following Jesus and praising the Lord and then living like a heathen. Why don't we do that? That's us. So we need to recognize that and realize when I deny myself, when I take up my cross every day, walking, following with Him, allowing Him to work on me and point out things in me that are unlike Him and giving me the grace and the space to pray about it and repent of it and restructure and reorient and adjust my life to Him because I'm following Him every single day. Now flip on over to 14, Luke 14. So the conditions, deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and then Luke 14, 26. You've got to put Jesus first. That's the fourth condition for a Jesus follower. He says, verse 26, If any man come to me and hate not father, mother, wife, children, brethren, sisters, his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is using what we call exaggerated language here. Hyperbole, if you like grammatical terms. He doesn't mean to hate. He means that other relationships compared to him would be seen in that light. He's got to be first. I think I've shared this with you before. We hear a lot of people talking about priorities today. 
Got to get your priorities straight down. Got to make God the priority of my life, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I've said this before, and Richard Green, the evangelist of South Africa, he taught me this way back in the 1990s. Tremendous insight from God. Richard Green said, when you put God on your priority list, He's no longer God. God is on a list all by Himself. He's God. But when you take God and put Him on your list, guess what? You're lining God up with your list. So we've got to put Jesus in a totally separate category and come to Him, walk with Him, talk with Him, follow Him, and allow Him to restructure those other relationships, other activities of life, how we order and structure what we do, our schedules, our time, etc., etc., our money, all that, because He's Lord of all of it. So Jesus is using this extreme, exaggerated language to emphasize the importance of placing Him first. And then, number five, conditions, got to count the cost. Now this is so important. He uses two examples here, verse 28 through 33. After he says, you've got to deny yourself or you can't follow me. He says, cannot, several times in this chapter. There at the end of verse 26, 27, 33. He says, you can't. You cannot. Unless you deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and put me first in another category of relationship. But then he says, take time. Think about it. He doesn't cram it down our throats. And that's why we can go to heaven, but not be much of a disciple. We can be saved by grace, but not really following Jesus. That's the challenge for us as individuals, but also the challenge for the church of making disciples. Christ-like Jesus followers. Some people say, I'm not going to do that. Some people say, oh, I'll do this, but not that. Some people say, hey, I'm all in. And we have different people in churches, all the time, at different places, different stages. Today, you may be walking close to God. A year from now, you may be far from God. Today, you may be far from God. A year from now, you may be close to God. So, it's something that is always moving, always changing. Why? Because life is always moving and always changing. But in the midst of all the movements and changes of life, guess what? He's the same. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's what we've got to keep our eyes on Him. But He does say in love, count the cost. Consider it. You see the two examples there, verse 28, somebody building a tower. And then a little bit farther down, somebody going to war. He says, who builds a tower without first sitting down and trying to see how much it's going to cost? Didn't want to start, not be able to finish. And then the, the war illustration there, thinking, who am I fighting and how many soldiers do they have? What's the military might of that? Do I just fight them or do I just say, let's make a peace treaty here? You know, you consider these things. And each one of us has got to do that. And we may have to do it multiple times in life. Because as I said, our lives change. We get older, children, marriage situations, finances, health, jobs. And Jesus is always lovingly, patiently, graciously, mercifully giving us space in the dignity of our own personhood to say, let me think about this, Lord. Let me consider what I may need to do to adjust my life to where I need to be. And He's very gracious to do that for you and I. But it's time sensitive. There's a shelf life to it. At some point, we've got to make a decision. Am I going to go on with Jesus or not? And that's the decision for every disciple to be a Jesus follower. So he says count the cost. But he doesn't say calculate the cost. Oswald Chambers, in his great devotional, My Utmost for His Highest, said this, The calculating spirit is death to faith. That's a great statement. 
You know, we can brood over something, and I tell Allison sometime, I said, I don't want to look at this till I get analysis paralysis. <laughs> you know, there's a time to look at it and think about it and pro and con it and pray about it. Read scripture, talk to other people, get some feedback. But at some point, we've got to fish or cut bait. At some point, we've got to say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Even when we may not know all the answers to all the questions. And so that's, that's what he's saying. Count the cost. Because it will cost you to follow Jesus. He's very honest about that. But listen to me. It'll cost you more if you don't. It'll cost you. It'll cost you marriage. It'll cost you kids. It'll cost you grandkids. It'll cost you at your job. To not, it'll cost you if you don't follow Jesus. But it'll cost you if you do. The difference is, when you follow Him, it costs, but it also pays. <laughs> the blessings of following Jesus. The joy of knowing that you're walking with Him as best as you can. Oh, sometimes we stumble. Yes, we do. Occasionally we fall, but He gets us back up. And we continue to follow Him. Those are the conditions for Jesus' followers. Back to Luke 9, please, and I'm done. Luke 9. End of the chapter. We talked about the call to Jesus' followers and the condition to be a Jesus follower. Let's conclude with this commitment word. This is the word that's most lacking in the church today, especially the Church of America. Commitment. The real commitment of my life to the one who gave his life for me. Luke 9, 57 through the end of the chapter uh, we see a couple of snippets of people who were either asked to follow or volunteered to follow Jesus. And I won't read all those verses, but the first guy showed up and he said, Lord, hey, that's a good word. Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, well, I may not have the best situation for you. You know, foxes, they got places to live, birds got nests, but the Son of Man doesn't have anywhere to lay his head. What he was speaking of there was the uncertainty of following him in the uh, limited perspective of everyday living. You know, all of us love security. All of us like to be secure, financially secure, a nice home, a job. We, we, we build our lives on that. And Jesus said, sometimes when you follow me, I will lead you into places where you can't feel the walls around you. You can't really know what's going to happen next Tuesday at 2 o'clock if you truly follow me. Now, obviously, that's rare. Usually the Lord leads us along in our lives, and His will is usually what's most reasonable and logical, makes the most sense, practical, beneficial, but sometimes not. Then He said to another, verse 59, follow me. But, there's that word. Lord, that's a good word. Let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. Go and preach the kingdom of God. He wasn't saying it wasn't good to go to somebody's funeral. He just saying, hey, there's important things to consider. And then, Lord, I will follow you, verse 61. But first, there's a priority. Let me go tell everybody by at the house. And Jesus said, verse 62, no one putting his hand in the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. So we have to make a commitment. And we may have to make a commitment more than once, depending on what's happened in our lives, to be a Jesus follower. And you may have thought this morning, and you may think in the next few weeks, you know, I'm not where I used to be. I'm not where I need to be. And I need to get back to doing this or that. And if you truly want to be a Jesus follower, He'll show you. He may have already shown you, and you just neglected to do it up to this point. But there's got to be a commitment to be a Jesus follower. You see, we're a nation of followers, like I said. God's made us to follow, to look up to, to look for. We've got Facebook followers now, Instagram, other internet platforms. You can follow people. You can see where they're going, what they're doing. You can be involved in all their stuff. You can follow famous people. You can follow your friends. All that stuff. A lot of people like to follow sports teams. 
Their life revolves around following the sport. They're interested in that. We was at a friend's house last night having supper, and there was kind of a little lull, and he said, well, it looks like the Cardinals are going to be a 500 team this year. <laughs> He's a Cardinal follower, and I don't mean birds. <laughs> talk about ball players. Uh, the weather. People like to follow the weather. They're big like this morning on that hurricane coming into New Orleans. You know, they're talking about the weather. Farmers follow the weather. That dictates their life. They think about it. A lot of people got up into following COVID numbers and mandates and things like that. That's a big source of uh, contention and conversation, right? <laughs> we never followed that before 2020, but now a lot of people following that constantly. It's driving them crazy. What are you following? We're all following something or someone. We are followers. We think we're a nation of leaders, but we're not. And if you want to be a leader in any avenue, you'll only become the leader of what you follow. So what are you following today? Who are you following today? And are you going to like where you're going when you get there? Because following someone or following something will eventually lead to an ultimate destination and destiny. Jesus is calling us to follow Him. So, Luke 9, 23, one more time. This is our memory verse this week. Notice what He says, Luke 9, 23. He said to them all, He said to everybody gathered at Oak Grove Baptist Church on August the 29th, 2021, He said to them all, If anyone will come after Me, there's the invitation, is to come to Him, that's where following begins, coming to Him, believing in Him, trusting in Him, being saved by Him, being born again, as we call it, being saved. So if anyone will come to Me, but it also means, as He says, come after Me. That is to keep it up, to continue following Me. But it also includes coming back to Me if you've drifted away, if you've become apathetic lukewarm, you find yourself being bitter about something in life or hurting about something in life or struggling with something in life. The Lord loves you. He's calling you back. So this idea of coming there, it's an invitation word. He says, if anyone will come to me, come after me, come back to me, here's what you need to do. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. The emphasis in verse 23, I'm almost done, thank you for your patience, is not on the denying self, it's not on the taking up the cross, it's not on the daily, it's not on the follow, the emphasis in verse 23 is on the me, me, me. Jesus says, come to me. Jesus says, come after me. Jesus said, come back to me. It's all about him. Following Jesus, being a Jesus follower, is simply that. We've got to do what the old song says. Turn our eyes upon Jesus and look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. And now with your head bowed. In a quiet moment before we dismiss, let's sing that together. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Jesus is still calling people to follow Him. Not just to be a Christian, to say, I'm going to heaven someday, and I hope you are, and if not, you can know today. You can come to Him today. And definitely not to be just a church member or a Baptist or whatever labels on the jar, <laughs> but to be a Jesus follower, walking with Him, talking with Him, living for Him, 
and making your life count for the cause of Christ. Yeah, the Bible calls it discipleship. A lot of literature calls it mentoring or different things, but ultimately your life and my life will be marked by who or what we follow. And here's one more thing before we go. One day we'll leave it all behind. What? What we followed. Who we followed. What invaded our minds and infiltrated our hearts. What possessed our passions. That's what we'll leave behind. And so Jesus wants us to follow him not only for the now and for the near and the next, but for eternity, knowing that one day we'll leave a legacy. So wherever you're at today, whatever's left of your life, follow Jesus. Let him lead and guide. Let him use you for his glory. And that's what people will remember when you and I or someplace else. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. Now let's stand together. Father, as we dismiss and move from worshiping You and spending time around Your Word, and we move into the fellowship hall for fellowship time and lunch together, we just pray, God, Your blessings on the meal, those who can stay and those who can't, we just pray, God, that we'll take this message, this concept, and we'll begin to pray and consider and become more and more the followers of Jesus that you would have us to be as we uh, operate within our homes and our school, as we go about our business, our jobs, and meet people in the community. Help us, Father, to be your followers. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We are dismissed right over here. I'll be up here at the front. If anybody needs prayer, would like to visit or talk about something. But the meal's right in here for you. God bless you. Have a good day.